Well, let's get started and then folks can jump in. Uh, they're running a bit late, uh, but I, we have a bunch to cover and so let's jump in. Um, so my name is Jay Harrison. I'm a volunteer at the Backyard Growers, which is why I have this shirt. Although now we need to start printing things backwards because uh, of Zoom. Uh, it's gonna be a growth industry. Good morning, hey. Hey, Corinne. Hey, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Welcome. Um, so again, my name is Jay Harrison. I'm a volunteer at the Backyard Growers. Uh, I am a former farmer. Um, and now a, I would say, lazy backyard uh, gardener. Um, and uh, so I thought we would, today we're talking about tomatoes. Um, and I just wanted to start off by saying, I wanna go around and kind of take questions in a minute, just so I make sure that I steer us where we need to go. But, uh, but just wanted to start off by saying, you know, coming at it from a farmer's perspective, <clears throat> Um, there's an unlimited amount of information to know about growing things, right? And there's billions and billions of dollars of our economy that are wrapped up in people successfully growing things. So it should be no surprise that, you know, there's researchers all over the world trying to figure out the optimal way to grow every little thing. Um, but that's not what we're doing, right? So like you you could spend 10 hours a week on one tomato plant if you wanted to get really obsessive and use all the information available to us to maximize the yield. And farmers have to think about it that way because it's their livelihood. For most of us, we just want a few delicious uh, tomatoes uh, for a week for as long as the, of the season as we can so that our salads and sandwiches and you know sauces and stews taste really good and uh you know so we're so i always have a hard time in these conversations where we have all these all of you who are different gardeners gardening for different reasons in different places like there's an unlimited amount of information. So I really wanna to try to focus it down to what's gonna be the most helpful to you. Um, and as my wife just said, well, what are you getting nervous about? You could talk about tomatoes till you're blue in the face. And I was like, exactly, that's the problem. <laughs> like, we don't want me talking about tomatoes till I'm blue in the face. What we want is to help you all get the information that you need. So I was hoping to just go around um, Corinne, who was it who sent their questions already? Um, Pratrap, is that you who sent questions in before through email? That's right. Okay. Fantastic. So I've got those. So thank you. Yeah, and we can. I can also, people can type messages in the chat function, and I can read those too if they want to. Great. Later. But so let's just go around and and uh, like I can start off. Like uh, I feel like I showed my cards. Like I wanna, I wanna have some tomatoes uh, throughout the season. I like to have cherry tomatoes. I like to have some big kind of beefsteak tomatoes. Uh, and I want sort of a steady supply of them, not in huge quantities through the season. So that's my goal is always figuring out how to get tomatoes for as long a period as I can. Uh, and why don't we go around, Paul, what, what brings you? <clears throat> so last year I had pretty good harvest, but the plants became blighted. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was doing wrong or could have done better to prevent that. And then it started to show up in like beans and it, yep. it became an epidemic, not a pandemic, just yeah. localized. So, yeah. Okay, great. So kind of that, how do you hold that off? That's great. Yep. So I'm just going to go in the gallery order that's here. So Thad. That's me, and yeah. I'm a total I'm a total beginner. Okay. Uh, with some time on my hands, I decided that uh, I'm going to uh, try some slicing tomatoes. Great. And 
but I know virtually nothing about it. I've been watching a few YouTube yes. things. Um, and I chose celebrity because that's what they had at Wolfville. <laughs> I'm probably just going to do one or two plants. Great. That's excellent. Uh, Luz. I to ask. Yes. Luz, what brings you? Well, first time grower too. Um, I was blessed to be able to offer this and I have a special um, uh, passion for food cooking and I'm going to, well, I really want to know everything. I don't know nothing about gardening. So from okay, the great. beginning, I'm starting. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Great, thank you, Liz. Okay, Michelle. So um, I've been growing tomatoes for a long time, but I missed your workshop last year and some of the people in um, the uh, Parkside garden were saying how great it was, um, specifically someone who's got a garden right next to me and mainly I'm interested in the pruning. Okay, yep, great. We're gonna spend a bunch of time on that. Uh, but uh, Pratap, do you have other questions or did, or were they captured well in those talking, asking about the three varieties? Um, they were captured well in the questions that I had, so I'll, I'll pass for now. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, Karen. What, do, what brings Hi. you? What are you interested in learning? Um, anything I can, really. I, okay. I don't have any specific questions. Uh, I, I suppose how to get rid of insects if they come on, that might have yeah. already been asked, so. That's yeah. it. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Oh, uh, my screen's a little, okay, Sally. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I'm super happy to be here. Thanks so much for, um, for, for hosting this and sharing what you know. Um, I'm also a total beginner um, and I'm just super excited to be growing for the first time um, what I am it's uh, it's been it's been awesome um, so anything that you're able to share is um, is wonderful to me um, I think in particular I'd be curious to, to know about like fertilizing and and what um, what kind of schedule is good for that um, yeah. and then and then also about like how to manage like insects um, that insects that might, might you know come in and, and creep up. Yep, that's great. Okay, thanks, Sally. Thank and you. Ellen, and Ellen, can you see us? Even though we just see your picture. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. I, um, that's yep. that's great. I just wanted to make sure that that uh, how much describing I have to do versus showing. <laughs> no, no, I can see, and and I'll show you my picture eventually. But right now, I'm eating. Yeah. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, half the time I'm doing the same thing. So. <laughs> but um, I'm uh, I'm also a, a a novice, so I'm just interested in learning the basics, best practices, things to look out for. That's it. Okay, great. All right, that's super Thank helpful. You. So I will jump in. Um, I got my little list that I was thinking about. Um, so. Uh, I feel like it's really important whenever you're talking about gardening to always start with the soil. So the soil, your soil is, you can't outgrow your soil is what I always say. And I feel like a lot of people say, oh, you know, I don't have a green thumb. I'm not good at growing things. I planted stuff and it didn't work out. Well, if you don't have good soil to start with, there's no amount of skill that you can have that will overcome that. Like, because you don't grow plants, plants grow themselves, and you're just there to remove obstacles and try to create a good situation for them to do what they're trying to do, right? So what's tricky about growing at home, like if you're growing on a farm, it makes sense to spend the money to get your soil tested and to develop really specific fertility programs based on those recommendations. But for most of us, if we're just growing a few plants, we have to kind of guess, right? And just, just do our best with limited information. So the most important thing is starting off with good soil. So if you're growing in containers, you know, that means buying really high quality 
soil. If you're in a community garden, uh, like the ones that the backyard gar growers run, usually, you know, the, or if you're a, if you have a backyard garden that the backyard growers grew, that's really high quality soil that you're starting with there. So you don't have to worry so much about that. But like I started off with my garden here in West Gloucester with maybe like a three quarters of an inch of soil on top of just sand and silt. So the I've had to put a lot of compost and effort into getting my soil to a place where it produces even reasonably well. Um, so <clears throat> since we're just taking a stab in the dark at, <laughs> with our soil, usually the best approach is I like to start with like three quarters to an inch of compost over the top of my whole garden area. And uh, one thing that's really important with the thinking about the soil instead of thinking about the plants is that like when you're fertilizing, when you're watering, anytime you're caring for your, your tomatoes, you really wanna be thinking about the soil as a whole, not just the plant, right? So like when you water, you really wanna be watering the soil so that you keep all of the area that the roots can be in moist, evenly moist and uh, you know, it's like a good cake. You don't want like a delicious moist half inch at the top of the cake and the rest of the cake is dry and terrible. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're thinking about the whole cake. And uh, so usually top dressing with compost. And then I really like our, uh, in terms of fertility, I really like Neptune's harvests that fish product that is made in Gloucester and you can get anywhere and there's really good instructions on the back just about what how much to add and on what schedule and I feel like I've I've started just the last couple of years I've started just following those recommendations and I've been having really good results with that even in my pretty terrible soil so and again I really like you know I really like to think about how am I fertilizing all of the soil? How am I mixing anything that I'm putting in into all of it? Um, so it all starts with the soil. And if you're having problems kind of year over year growing stuff, 99% sure that the soil is your problem. Um, so, and I, I can talk about that a little bit more, but I just feel like the this whole thing about growing organically is healthy soil, sets up healthy plants and healthy plants produce a lot of good food for you. And if your soil's unhealthy or your plants are unhealthy, there's nothing you can do uh, to overcome that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, so starting with planting. So like, again, what's interesting about, about plants, right, is you're, you're, the, the stuff that you do early on ends up having a huge effect down the road. You know, like plants grow on this kind of like, I don't think exponential is actually right, but this, this ramped up curve. And so getting, so getting your soil really, um, starting with really good soil, buying or growing really healthy seedlings so, so if you plant seedlings that are really not in great shape, they will never recover. You know, it's, that's just not how plants work. Like you, you kind of with plants have to keep things in reasonably good shape at each step. So like if you have <laughs> seedlings that are really like tall and stringy or, or um, that like all the leaves are, don't look vibrant and green, don't have a strong stem, that's really a waste of your time. You know, it's like, if you think about it, you're gonna put a bunch of effort into this thing and you know, you can spend a couple bucks at Cedar Rock or someplace like that and get a seedling that is really in good shape and is gonna serve you well for the season. So I feel like the, the in order of problems that people run into is either, you know, number one, starting with bad soil. Number two, starting with seedlings that are already weak or compromised in some way. 
So, um, you know, I really recommend, you know, don't plant things that look sad. You know, if you put, plant like the Charlie Brown uh, Christmas tree uh, tomato seedling, uh, you know, a lot of us have a soft spot in our heart for things that look like they're struggling, but <laughs> with tomatoes, you're just not, it's not gonna go well. Uh, and is anybody starting, is everybody buying tomato starts or is anybody starting them themselves? Buying. Go ahead. Every, raise your hand if you've started them yourself. Okay, great. So again, really, really shopping carefully and trying to buy really stocky, strong looking plants is key. Um, so, one, so Jay, oh, yeah. <clears throat> when do you decide to um, pull the plug on a plant that doesn't seem to want to do much? I've got two that I picked up at uh, down in Maritime, and then one of them's doing well, and the other one's just sort of doing nothing. And, and maybe they're different varieties, so they're on a different pace, but I don't know when that is that I'm going to have to go for something else. I would give it another. I would give it a week because then you're going to start getting into a place that you really want them in the ground. You know, it's like we're right on the sort of edge of, of that. So I would, I would give it a week. If it's not growing, if you're giving it water and it's got sun and it's not growing, you've got a problem. Okay. And hold on one second. I'm going to grab a really sad looking tomato seedling that's left over from my stuff. Hold on. Okay, these are ones that I did not plant, and they're much worse now than they were. But, uh, oh, you're not going to be able to see these very well, actually. But, uh, we can see it. Okay, and you can see they're kind of yellow. They've got their spindly, you know, they're kind of cute. I have a strong impulse to try to rescue them, but I'm not going to get a lot of good fruit out of this, you know? So, like, you want them shorter, stockier richer green, a richer green color, um, and all of that. Uh, so then going on to planting, when you plant, what's really cool about tomatoes uh, is that they have all, let me see if I can get this close enough. They have all these teeny hairs that grow on the stem. All of those are potential roots. So like if I take this tomato and I lay it down on the soil sideways, it'll start to grow roots down from anywhere on the stem because the, all those little hairs on the tomato um, are excellent defense against climbing bugs. I think that's a big part of why they're there. Bugs don't like that, don't like climbing over surfaces like that. But they also are able to drop roots anywhere off of their stem, which is A, just really cool, but B, uh, it means that when you plant tomatoes, and I think a lot of you have heard of this before, you can actually dig and plant them pretty deep. Like you don't have to plant them at the soil line. You can dig a hole and like this one, I, if I were to plant this, I would probably plant the bottom four inches of stem and just have the green part because all you're going to get all of that. That stem doesn't do me any good. And if it can be if it can produce roots and help feed my plant, all the better. So planting tomatoes deep uh, is great. Sometimes there'll even be a few leaves on the bottom and I'll pluck those off and then plant a bunch of the stem and just leave the best looking green at the top. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just, I just think, yeah, go ahead. Jay, do you do that even when the plant is healthy or just when it's sad? No, I do it even when it's healthy. <laughs> just it's a good good to just get the get as much of that rooting area as possible. So, you know, you don't have to do that, but a lot of the time, even with a good stocky plant, they're a, they've been growing inside usually. So they're a little even <clears throat> when you've done a good job, they can be a little wobbly. So even even just planting them an inch or so deep kind of strengthens the stem and gives them a good, good starting place. Uh, so, 
that's planting. I oh, and then the other thing with planting is watering them in right away is critical. So like you've just plucked so with a seedling like this, I've just plucked it out of the the growing container I'm in. The roots are all exposed now, right? Then when I'm putting it in, this is all going to get kind of disturbed. And then uh, if I don't water it right away, the roots can dry out really quickly. So like, especially with the weather having been what it has been with dry soil, you know, like you're, you're taking a plant from this cushy indoor life where it's been being watered all the time. It hasn't had to deal with wind. It hasn't had to deal with the full brightness of the sun because usually greenhouse plastic doesn't let all the light through. So it's moving outside into this environment where it's windier, sunnier, usually hotter than it's used to. And getting water to those roots right away and allowing them to form a good contact with the soil around. Like that's how farmers think about it. They're always thinking about root to soil contact. So like if you can really get, put a lot of water on in that initial planting, so that not only do the roots get water and the soil get wet, but the soil kind of settles in around those roots, your plants are gonna be a lot happier. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask? Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the good soil, I got my box last year with the soil that was given to me and I thank yeah. you for it. Yeah. Uh, but this year, what I did was I put some compost on it, but maybe about a half an inch and my husband uh, spread it around and dug it up a little bit. Yeah. I don't know whether I have good enough soil because I, I, I don't know what kind of soil that was given to me initially. And I don't know if I should be fertilizing my plants, my tomatoes and or my others with some sort of a liquid fertilizer or uh, powder or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing that your soil is in really good shape, Karen, and a, like a little bit of fish fertilizer just does magic. I mean, I have- Fish fertilizer, okay. Like, like Neptune's Harvest, which is made in Gloucester is such a great product and uh, the nutrients in it are so available, so. Okay. You know, where do I get it? And, and what, 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 there, yeah, most our, places, uh, most places, and most hardware stores in Gloucester okay. have it. Like okay. uh, definitely, the building center does. I'm sure Ace does. Uh, Wolf Hill, I'm sure. But Wolf Karen, Hill. we also have it in our uh, backyard growers reopen the shop, the online shop, and it's available there. Yeah, uh, on and a little bit goes a long way. I mean, they have the they have the instructions in there, but it's like one part fish fertilizer to to 128 parts water. So it's like a like a little splash in a watering can uh, helps okay. a lot. Okay, so, thank that, you. That's a great question though, yeah. So, so I, I wanna just step in from, and I was advised to get Costa Maine lobster compost because it's got the lobster shells composted in there and they pointed out that tomatoes need a lot of calcium. Calcium, yeah. And so either either the coast, you know, either the lobster compost or the Neptune's harvest is a good thing. I've had trouble with Neptune's harvest. What some animal keeps digging up anything I plant with, oh, them, yeah. with them. So yeah, I mean I usually put it in the soil. Yeah. And so they dig up my seedlings and 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 I guess they're eating the lobster shells. I don't know what that would be. But. This is the thing. This is the thing about gardening. There's always something, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's lots of other products. If you're having that problem, you know, there's lots of other organic fertilizers that you can get. Like there's there's alfalfa meal ones. There's blood meal ones. It's a like, but I would go for a balanced one because uh -huh. once you're doing soil tests, you don't have any idea what the deficiency, like what, what you need. So I right. just would recommend, I mean, compost is the best. And then just as the season goes on, it's nice to give them a little extra something um, to help grow. I've never grown with the lobster stuff. Like I have had my soil tested and it's again, terrible and the calcium's fine in there. So 
you know, it's again, okay. it's such a, it's such a guess. I mean, it's certainly yeah. not going to hurt, but it's just like, do you need to do that? You know, you're <laughs> flying blind a little bit. Um, right. Um, yeah, I thank don't you. Think I, I, I uh, tried putting eggshells in and yeah. I wouldn't recommend it because there were a lot of birds that were in the bed. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. was before I planted and I, and I had eggshells all over the place and they were in there picking. I know. It's some, everything <laughs> likes something, right? So it just depends what the, the everything is that you're, <laughs> you're contending with. Um, the, okay, that's great. So, um, so that's, that leads me into watering, which is, you know, always something that people have a ton of anxiety about when they're starting out. And I think one of the things that, that I've learned that just helps me a lot is just measuring instead of guessing. So like what I, I've got my hose and uh, I have a two gallon watering can and I just took it and I took the sprayer that I used to water my garden and just put a timer on, on my phone and measured. It takes 30 seconds to fill my two gallon uh, watering can with water, which means I'm getting four gallons a minute. And here's a helpful tip for all of you, so you all don't have to do all the math, is it takes 20 gallons to cover a a uh, four by eight garden bed with an inch of water, which is what you want every week. So if it doesn't rain at all, it takes 20 gallons to water your whole bed, right? Per, so, per week? Per week. Per, oh, yeah. per week, okay. Yeah, and again, everybody's soil is different. Some people have clay soils, in which case you don't have to water so much. Some people have dust uh, soil, which is what I have. So I have to water a lot. Um, and usually what's funny is like we live in a climate where we get an inch of rain a week on average anyway, right? So like theoretically we should just have to water to get our thing started, but that isn't how it works because it doesn't, it doesn't come, you know, it doesn't rain an inch every week on Friday at six, you know, it's like, and right now it hasn't rained in a long time. So when it's not raining, really to do uh, to do what farmers do, which is to try to get one inch of water on your garden every week, that takes 20 gallons, which is quite a bit of water, you know? And so with me, with my hose, it's gonna take me five minutes of watering to get an inch onto a, a four by eight raised bed, right? So I just feel like that takes a little bit of the mystery out of it. You know, it's like you can feel the soil, you can dig down, make sure it feels moist, and that's great. And if you're just, I just find that very helpful. It's like what I'm shooting for is an inch a week. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Um, and yeah, and then, and then I really like to mulch when I can, because I like to think about, um, I don't know why I think about my soil as cake. Uh, maybe it's because I like cake, but the thinking about keeping even moisture in your soil at all times, like your, your soil, not to get too nerdy about it, but like your soil is a, is a living thing. There's probably like a trillion microorganisms in your soil that are all eating, digesting things, breaking them down into smaller things that then your plants are taking up and using to feed themselves. And like, you just want that party to be a good party all the time, you know? Like you want those micro, like I used to teach teenagers and I'd say, just picture a disco ball down over the top of that thing and you just want like a good beat going and all the microorganisms partying all the time. And the key to that party is feeding them enough, which we've talked about and keeping them watered. And that's, that's what keeps the party going. So like, I like to use just straw mulch is the best thing I think for me. I've used leaf mulch before. There's all kinds of different mulches you can put on. I like to, to get those on um, 
Yeah, as early as possible to just keep the top layer of soil from drying out all the time. You know, it's like, I just don't, like you're, you're, if you're drying out the top inch of your soil all the time, it's just not, you're losing that soil basically because it's not, the party has stopped in the dry soil. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to mulch, you know, and if it's hard and it's going to be more trouble than it's worth, then don't do it. But just the point is like good, even soil moisture makes a huge difference um, for your plants. And it actually affects how much nutrients are available to your, to your plants. Because if it's dry and there's no party going on, even there can be as much lobster, delicious lobster shell as possible, but none of that is available to the plants if little microorganisms aren't breaking it down. So, um, so water also helps with fertility, actually. Um, okay, I've been talking a long time. Uh, okay. Yeah. So when you go to fertilize, you pull the mulch back? Yeah. Okay. I like to. That's also what I like about straw mulch is it's easy to move. You know, it's like you can see it just kind of slides out of the way. You can mix it into the top. I mean, that's the other nice thing about liquid fertilizers too, though, is I just water over the top. Uh, you know, I'm going to lose a teeny bit. I mean, you don't really lose anything. I, I, so that's the other reason I like liquid fertilizers. It's just easier. I don't have to move anything. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to take you out to show you, I'd rather just show you the pruning stuff. Um, but I can tell you just, uh, so getting into the questions of different varieties, like the thing to think about when you're thinking about both pruning and trellising, which are the two things we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna do my best to show you with my, I'll try not to make you sick moving around with the video uh, camera, uh, is that, is weight. So this is something people underappreciate a lot. Um, so if you're growing cherry tomatoes, the weight is distributed really evenly, right? So like you've got cherry tomatoes all over, they're not very heavy. I mean, maybe all of them together are a little bit heavy, but they're, they're spread out, right? So if you just think about the weight that's on this plant, trying to pull it down, cherry tomatoes just trellis really easily, right? So you, you don't need to be thinking about engineering that much when you're doing, uh, when you're dealing with cherry tomatoes. And so you can, yeah, so anyway, that's that. When you're growing beefsteaks or like some of those heirloom varieties that produce big, like I like brandy wine tomatoes. I mean, you'll get like a two pound tomato on there every once in a while. So what I like to think about with trellising is like, if I do a really good job, I might get 20 plus pounds of tomatoes off of a plant, there might be 10 to 15 pounds on the plant at any time. That's a bowling ball, you know? So like whatever your trellising is, if you can't hang a bowling ball off of it, then the, 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 that's the amount of weight that the tomato, a tomato plant can, can weigh, you know? So I get really annoyed at the makers of those really spindly tomato cages which I think work fine for really small varieties uh, and cherry tomatoes, although they're never tall enough. I, I, I don't quite understand that design, but if you're growing big beefsteak tomatoes, that don't, would you, you wouldn't think about hanging a bowling ball off of a little spindly cage like that. So um, if you grow big beefsteak tomatoes, you really need something that is strong. So I will sh show you some ideas, some things that I use um, to deal with that. Um, yeah, let's just go out there and see, see what we can do. Hold on, let me see if I can get you all on my phone. Uh, uh, Corinne sent me the link. I sent it to you, uh, yeah, tell me if that worked. You know what? I actually this this computer's got tricks, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. Oh, wow. oh good, it didn't break in half when I folded it. Okay, so we'll do our best, and I may get my wife Karen out here in a minute to help if, if this doesn't really. Uh oh. 
touching things I shouldn't touch. <laughs> uh oh. Can you we still can see me? See yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can't see you all, and I can't see the video. So let me. Uh, you're seeing my face. Yes. 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 Oh. Yeah. Can you come hold it? Great. Thanks. I've got. I've got a system. Backup. Got backup. Now I just have to find you all again. You may have hit stop video or? No, it did something funny. I just, I pressed keys I shouldn't have pressed. <laughs> We've all done it. Yeah. So Kara, if you just hold this like this. So they can see me. So they can see me. Okay. And they'll shout out. You're going to need both hands, I think. Okay, well, let's go ahead. Okay. Okie doke. So here we are in my garden. I hope you can see me. Yes. Yep. 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 Okay. Just shout out if you can. Okay. okay. So a couple, I want to talk about uh, trellising first because you're going to prune to your oh. trucks. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it the how you prune is kind of governed a little bit by how you trellis. <laughs> so I wanted to show you uh, three quick ways that I um, that I trellis. Uh oh, you're stepping on your zinnias. Okay. So <laughs> this is a kit that the backyard growers I'm building for the backyard growers that I think works really well. I had to put this up really quickly this morning. Um, so usually I'd have this a little tighter. It's just two garden stakes like this with a cross piece and then the cross piece nailed into the top with uh, this mesh. And what I like about this is you can grow beans on it, you can grow peas on it, and you can grow tomatoes on it. So if you look over here, I've got my peas growing um, on it and it works really well. So it's, go back. So it's uh, pretty multifunctional. Um, so now let's get down here with the plant. Again, shout out if you can't see. Uh, so this is a cherry tomato um, that I've got growing in a pot here. Um, what I'm gonna do to this cherry tomato, so I, I have started pruning it already, so I'm sorry I can't show you all of it. But basically, the way a tomato grows, um, it's going to try to send a sucker out from every crotch in the plant. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. If you let, if I don't prune that, it's gonna turn into uh, what we call a leader, which is this, and it's gonna become like co-equal with this. So if I don't prune this, the plant will grow into two, two distinct paths. You know what I mean? You'll get two big branches off anywhere that you don't take these off. Does that make sense? So if I were to do nothing to this plant, there would be a there would be a little sucker at each of these. And if I didn't prune it at all, you would have, you know, 15 different main branches going off of it. And it would just become a mess, right? It would become, it wouldn't fit in the space. You're not gonna get good light on all parts of the plant. So the fruit isn't gonna be as sweet. You're gonna get, uh, it'll just turn into a mess and it'll start breaking and falling all over the place. So what I like to do in a situation like this is I probably would not, I would take, I would pick one of these suckers and just leave it. And then I would train this plant. This part is gonna go this way and I leave this sucker to grow this way. So that I have a the camera wall. closer to the plant? Yeah, closer to the plant. And also director at the plant, you're not seeing the plant. Okay, there's the plant. Okay, so Ooh. I would leave one of the suckers and it would, I would let it grow this way and this part's gonna grow this way. A little lower, please. This right here. See this little guy? No, <laughs> go down. She needs to aim down. There you okay. go. This guy? Yeah. So that's the sucker. So, like the like everybody says, remove all the suckers. Well, that's generally true unless you want another branch. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. yeah. So if I want another branch going this way, I'll leave this one, which I think I probably will actually. And then I'll, I'll prune this one that's next to it. And I'll prune this one that's below it. And I've already pruned the ones below. And you just pinch them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. And getting them young is good because you don't want the plant wasting energy on things that you're just going to take off. But if you if they get bigger than a pencil thick, don't pinch them. Use scissors to cut them. OK, mm -hmm. so that's all that. So then as it grows, what's nice about this kind of trellising is the leaves. You can just kind of tuck them in like this. You don't have to do all of them, but then it's going to be supported and I can send this one this way. I can let my little sucker over here grow this way. And then you're just kind of weaving the plant here. I can take it back for a second. <clears throat> you're just kind of weaving the plant back onto the mesh. You know what I mean? So that you're forming like a solar panel of the tomato so that it's catching as much light and it's kind of flat ish. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, Jay? Uh, yeah. So, where so did you get the some... mesh? Go ahead. So, where did you get the mesh? I've never seen that before. So. Oh yeah. So the backyard growers. These are kits that the backyard growers are putting together. So we'll, we can, Corinne, we can talk at the end about that. But yeah. so okay. that's one. That's one method. Okay. Method two. And can I hand this back to you? Uh, method two, which is actually to be transparent, is what I do is over here. So this is a Brandywine tomato. I haven't done any, I stopped doing stuff to it once I found out the workshop was happening. So here's a Brandywine. I, I about 20 years ago, spent what is probably $100 in today's money. And I got a whole roll of this mesh that they used for concrete pouring and I made this cage and these cages last 50 years. So it was, yes, it was expensive, but I got about 20 of them out of it. And um, now they, I use them for a lot of things, but like, this is a proper, like, you know, I can hang a bowling ball off the top of this and it's gonna be fine. Uh, and then as this grows up, sometimes the plant will try to kind of slip down through and then I just slip stakes like a piece of bamboo or something through and it gives the tomato something to hold on to as it goes up um so that's another kind of option but it doesn't have any support right now it doesn't need any support for a little while so as it grows if it starts to kind of fall over i'll i'll put a stick through like this a stick through like that and then it kind of grows up and i don't know it kind of works for me and i've had them for years uh I like them. Uh, so Jay, you Jay, you don't need any central stick to hold up the main stem. No, because I go like this. Uh, I usually have sticks kicking around, but I just don't right now. As it grows, if it looks, sometimes the plant will grow and the leaves will come out far enough so that it gets held by the leaves. If that's not happening enough, I'll just slide uh, down a little bit. This I'll just slide sticks through like this ah. and, and prop it up. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, that's option two. Option three, that is probably the easiest, but sometimes I find it to just be a little messy sometimes. But what I used to do when I was farming and doing lots and lots of tomatoes in a shot. Uh, here, care, hold that. Oh, I just made that. Your okay, well, it doesn't really matter. Okay, ignore that. is I can put two stakes in the ground like this 
I can actually have two tomatoes in this case. So I can have this here. I can have another tomato there. And then you can just take any string, really. I have this. This is what farm, farmers use. This is the commercial version of this. But any string works. Um, and you just tie. So this is called stake and weave. So you take it and you run it on one side. He is keeping it taut. And you just go back and forth like that and tie it. And then you can tie it off here at this stage. And then you come back later once the plant's grown up and you do stake and weave. That, it's probably the simplest way to do it. Uh-oh, you all still there? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we lost them. Oh, we're here, Jay. We're here. We're here. <clears throat> Jay, can you hear us? Back into that. Jay. When he talk, when you talk, your picture comes up. Oh, great. You can see and hear us? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Well, in that case, I apologize if there was any cursing. Uh, let me, I can't see or hear you. So let me jump back in. We can somehow. hear you. So sorry, y'all. No, we didn't lose you at all. So can you send him a message that um, he's on the screen? Yeah, I have. Embarrassing that you can see yeah. me, but I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, so you can't see us, you, but we can, we can see you, you and hear you. Sorry, I just that you can't see us, though. Text him on his cell phone. I think it's coming back up. I did. Okay. I think it just the Zoom dropped for some reason. Corrine, sometimes when this happens, I oh. I end up having to leave and then come back. Mm -hmm. And it's not really a unique problem. It's happened, you know, like it's it's happened in a number of Zoom meetings I'm in. Uh -huh. You just you just leave, even if you're the host. Um, you leave and you just come back and it's fine. Jay, can you hear us? No. no. Okay, let me text him that. <clears throat> and he should also, he should he's also not going to, he's not going to end the meeting. He's just going to leave the meeting. Yeah. Let me see if I can call his wife, actually. Yeah, and also- Okay, y'all, I think we need to relaunch. I'm sorry. So if you just hang up and jump back on. Or he, um, so- Yeah, I'm going to the phone. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, the problem is I'm the- I think- Yeah. Yeah, let me call him because I think I'm actually the host as well because I signed into our account. So if when Jay shuts down, so Michelle, in the past when the host leaves, yeah. it doesn't mm -hmm. shut the video down, right? 
It doesn't. What happens is, um, <clears throat> what happens is, I have to go back in. I have to sign back in. Yeah. And this is when I'm the host. It's when I'm running my classes. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, like, of course, they don't know what the first time it happened. They didn't know what was happening. Um, but they they hung in there. So when I came back into the meeting, we just continued. Yeah. Okay. And I think it should be fine. He. There he goes. There he is. I'm so sorry, everybody. Okay. We got My you. back? Yeah. Yes, you are. No. Uh oh. No. You just muted. No. Um. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. There we go. I'm so yeah. sorry. That's embarrassing. I've never taken it on the road before. That was the problem. <laughs> the um, so the stake and weave method is probably the simplest. Were you all able to see that? Yeah. Yes. 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 In that option, how close can you keep the plants, or how far apart should the tomatoes be? Yeah, that's a great question. Probably. Um, <laughs> Probably okay. varies a teeny bit based on the variety. Like if you have a, a bigger a bigger variety, like a bigger beefsteak, I want to say maybe two feet apart. Oh, that's all. Okay. And then you know you could probably be a little closer with like celebrity. You know, celebrities. It's a smaller fruit, so you could probably be a teeny. You know, eighteen inches, but two feet would be great. Also, um, I'd say two feet in general. Uh, so that's that's another really great option. That's stake and weave. The only thing is that, like, if you are really conscientious and go in every week and put on another string, that works great. If you get a little behind, uh, you end up having to fight the plants a lot. So, and it's hard to not break them a bunch if you're trying to play catch up with that method, but you know, it works well and it's kind of the simplest. Um, but then other people do things with teepees and other things. I just have never done that before. So I can't, I don't like to make advice about things that I've never done myself, but you know, there may, there are, there are a million, um, ways to do it. Oh, there was one other method though that I wanted to say, which is if you have like a, uh, if you're growing underneath a pergola or something, can you grab the string actually? The, something that works really well if you're able to just hang a string from something. So like, remember how I had that top bar, I had the two stakes on the ground and then the top bar with the mesh. If you take away the mesh and there's just the top bar, you can also just tie a string from the top of the top bar. Um, and, oh yeah, that's, never mind here. It's okay. And what you can do is just make a loop around the bottom, around the base of the tomato, around the stem. Uh, so like if the stem's like this, the soil's here, you just tie a little, you tie a string in a little loop around the bottom yeah. like this. <laughs> and then you just run the string up to whatever that is and tie it so that it's a little bit taut. And then you can just take the plant and as it grows, wrap that central leader around it. To some extent, do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So like you're just twisting, you're just twisting the plant around the stem as it grows, but then you really have to prune everything except one central leader or it'll start ripping itself apart. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's another method that works really well, but you have to have something to tie it to on the top. So that can be stakes, that could be a pergola. I've got my crazy geodesic dome over there that I've done I've done <laughs> that uh, before. Um, but I think that the key is just to making a decision at the beginning. You know, like, am I gonna do one liter? Am I gonna do two liters? Am I gonna try something crazy where I trellis it in three or four liters? I don't recommend that. But just making that decision, and then you know what you're pruning f towards. You know what I mean? Like you're, there's a shape that you're going for, which is like, you know, either one plant like this with fruit hanging from it, or something that splits and fruit hanging from it. 
Okay, yeah, sorry, I've been talking too long. I'm being given the, the sign. The, uh, Can I ask you a question that we get asked a lot? Yeah. Um, around pruning, just in terms of leaves touching the dirt. Oh, um, yes, that's a great question. So I like to prune the bottom really heavily once the fruit starts to set. So I like to take away all of the leaves below the first cluster of tomatoes once they start coming together. Because to your question, Paul, you were talking about blight, right? Yeah. So a lot of, there's a lot of soil borne diseases. So if you don't, if you have mulch, this helps with this actually. But a lot of the time what happens is the rain falls and hits the soil and the soil splashes up on the leaf, the lower mm -hmm. leaves and spreads soil borne disease to the lower leaves. And then that kind of starts working its way up the plant. Um, so pruning away the lower leaves, I, I highly recommend because you're gonna get better airflow under the plant, which encourages, just discourages disease. Um, and those are the oldest leaves and they're not very efficient when they get old. So uh, I, I like to prune everything below that first fruit cluster. Great, okay. Um, and then in terms of blight and, and actually insects and all those other things, I know we're running out of time, um, <clears throat> is uh, I, the best, the most important place to start to focus on is on the soil health and water. Like, like humans, like all living things, the healthier you are, the better your ability to resist disease, right? So like, the healthier your soil is, the more evenly watered your plants are. Plants have their own kind of immune system to both inside, they're producing chemicals that are toxic to insects. And uh, they, they can fight pretty well, but they have to be healthy. So the, the most important thing you can do for disease and pests is healthy plants. Um, and really interestingly, like sometimes on, the, on a farm, You'll be walking along and there'll be, you know, 200 eggplants in a row and one of them will just be covered in bugs. And that's because that plant probably got damaged in some way when it was getting planted and its immune system, you know, immune system is weak and all the bugs attack that plant. So uh, that's the most important thing you can do is, is keep your plants healthy. Um, and then there are some things like blight that blow in, you know, there's a lot of like, like, mil like powdery mildew and some other diseases, they blow in on the wind. And all you can really do is keep your plants healthy and, uh, and try to hold on as long as you can, really. Could you talk a little bit about staggering the crop? Uh, uh, rotate, like not planting them in the same place? No, uh, how do you get the maximum amount of yield through the, through the summer? Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, again, there's an endless amount of information about this. Like, in general, the way to get the highest yield in tomatoes is you... So farmers call them hands. They're the fruit clusters. So you get a bunch of flowers that turn into the fruit. You call that a hand. So the, the, if you're really trying to get as much fruit as possible uh, for growing at this time of the year, you want to leave no more than three tomatoes on the first and second hand. So you prune the flowers back so that you have three tomatoes on the first two clusters, and then you allow four on all the subsequent ones. Um, but again, I don't do that because I don't, I'm lazy as a gardener and I don't spend the time, but like the research shows that that's how you get the highest yield. I'm more or less a fair because I am lazy. Uh, but the, so you don't have to do that, but if you want to get real scientific and precise about it, you leave three flowers on those first two clusters and then you leave four on the subsequent ones. But then also the way that, you, so 
the other thing is like by, by doing all those things that we talked about and you're pruning and there's good airflow and all the leaves are getting good light and the fruits, you're having fewer fruits, but higher quality fruits. That's how you're gonna get the biggest yield. A lot of the time people don't wanna prune. They wanna just let it get as big as possible. And you just end up with like a lot of not very good quality. Yeah, sorry, more questions? Um, Jay, you for the most part, have you planted all your tomatoes you have so far? I have, yeah. And do you plan on planting more or are you pretty much, would you say most people should be about done by now? So some people do like a second planting. If you take good care of your plants though, they'll keep producing well. I mean, you, you could do a second planting. I've done that before on the farm. Um, some people, so most of the tomatoes we grow are called indeterminate, which means they'll just keep, they're a vine, they'll just keep growing and growing and growing. If you're growing them in a hoop in a greenhouse, you know, you can get a 20 foot long vine, like some of those Dutch operations that are growing them. They just keep lowering the vine and growing more and more. That's called indeterminate. Um, they'll keep growing until they either get killed by frost or blight or something. Um, but then there's determinate ones that grow to a fixed size. They produce the fruit they're gonna produce and then they stop growing. Some people plant determinants a little later and then you get sort of a bigger crop in September, uh, sort of more all at once. Um, I don't do that. Uh, I usually just try to take good care of my plants and get as much as I can off of my indeterminate ones. Um, but again, we're getting a little technical now, but that's, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one. How, how big should your seedlings be before when you plant them? That's I, mine's question. only about six inches tall right now. How, how many leaves do you have? Are there a lot of leaves on there? Yes. I think I'd go for it then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I think they're gonna grow better in the ground at this point than staying in the pot. Oh, okay. I have a question. Yeah. So I have three plants of tomatoes planted in a bucket. This is my first time, so yeah. I need help here. So I had, Thank God, um, they put me a bed now and I'm gonna start planting on Monday. Yeah. But uh, is it better for me to do, leave it on the pot or put them in the ground, on the ground? They're going to, they're going to go they're on like the ground? They're like this big right now. They're like yeah. this big. I'd plant them. Yeah, on the, in the ground. Okay. In the ground, yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. I mean, generally when the, the, this was actually a really hard season because the nights have stayed you know, now I think we're past it, but the nights were really cold. So like generally tomatoes like it when the night temperature is over 55 okay. degrees, which I, I, you know, we're, we're there now, but it was a long time. My peppers look terrible right now because it just keeps getting cold at night. And I think they'll bounce back, but uh, so no, I would plant them. And then the other thing that, that beginning gardeners do is they plant their tomatoes too close together. So just make sure to give them Definitely. enough space because they're li the it makes sense. The plants are little. You're like, oh, I'll plant them. Yeah. What looks so you like said two feet apart. It's good, right? Eighteen inches to to two feet. Okay. And I, I would give yourself extra room if you're starting off because like you have to be able to get people forget about themselves in the equation a lot. And like you mm -hmm. want to be able to get around your plants comfortably. You know, I would space them out a little bit and plant some other things underneath them rather than planting them too close okay. together. You know what I mean? Like, so you can plant anything you want in between them. Anything is good. Yes, Gen generally. That, okay. Yeah, generally. Cilantro. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I yeah, mean, well, lettuce. Lettuce is great to plant. I I do a lot of basil under mm -hmm. them. You know. I like things like that that are kind of leafy, but mm -hmm. I don't know why. That's I was gonna, I was gonna give. I don't know if this is good, but I have done this for my plants, my flowers, where I have a lot of bunnies and they come around and eat the, the everything, and I put cinnamon around and they stop that. 
Oh. Is cinnamon okay? Cinnamon uh, powder. Is that okay to put around? I've never heard of that, but bigger. I don't know why that would be bad. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but they just a couple like other it. things like that. And again, I'll be very quick. Is like, there's a, if you smoke or have people who smoke who are going to be working in the garden with you, one of the easiest diseases to transmit comes from tobacco. Oh. So if you are a smoker, you should always wash your hands with soap before you handle tomatoes because there's a tobacco, it's called the tobacco mosaic virus. And it's very easy to transfer from cigarettes to your plants. So that's, okay. uh, but no, I've heard of people doing that with cayenne pepper and I've never heard of cinnamon, but I, it's very strong and maybe bunnies mm -hmm. don't like that smell. They don't like the smell, the, the, yeah. the squirrels and bunnies. No, I believe it. <clears throat> Can you get a good sized tomato to grow, uh, plant to grow out of the seven and 10 gallon felt containers? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you just have to be particularly aware of watering. You know, that, that's the only thing I'd, that's plenty of soil, but as long as there's enough water. Any other last questions? So I know that was a lot and sorry for the technical problems. And I'm sorry if I was cursing when you could hear me during the technical problems. We never heard you curse. That's oh, good. We never did, yeah. Good. That was just um, in my own head. Uh, how lucky. The, um, so again, for you beginner gardeners, just one, just summing up simplest thing is you know try to start add a little compost like don't fret it add a little compost plant them water them really well when you plant them try to keep an eye on the watering and just give them enough space so like give them space cut take off all those suckers so that they have enough space and you'll get it'll go great and Jay, okay. focus on watering at the base of the plant, right? Not the yeah, not on the leaves. If when you when you water during, especially during the hot part of the day, it uh, the the water droplets can make little magnifying glasses on the mm -hmm. on the Neat. plants and can burn the plants on a really mm -hmm. bright day. So you know if you if you water with a hose and you have to get, it's better just to water the soil and not water the leaves. But if you have to water the leaves, because that's what your watering situation is, I think early morning is the best, because then the plant has a chance to dry out and uh, it has enough water to have a good time during the heat of the day. Can you start pruning a relatively okay. small plant? Yeah. Yep. And in general, pruning, like especially once the plant is, you know, once it's planted and you've watered it in, it's a little fragile for 10 days to two weeks. You know, it's acclimating to its environment. But once you see it start to really grow, I'm a big fan of pruning. I feel like people generally under prune, not over prune. And you want light and airflow, you know, like dense packed together leaves get diseases. So the more open and airy you can make it, the better you're gonna do. So if, if a leaf doesn't look good, take it off. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much Thank for you. doing this. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. Good luck this season. Um, we have it, we do have this uh, recorded too, so let me know if anyone wants it. But Jay, Thank you. Very you. Much. Enjoy yeah. the weekend, everybody. Yeah, Thank take care. You. Thank you. Thanks for all your classes. You too. Bye. 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 Goodbye.